meeting. Was it you, you also? I, I just did. Okay, we're here. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm going to change my Zoom name to be Mercer Law School because people would be like, who is Laura? Okay, we're here. Where's my toolbar? Oh, wait.
competition. This is an exciting part of the year, which usually happens in the spring of the year. Our happy first year students. Any in the room? Excellent. I hope we have some joining us online. Normally, the first year students do not get this advantage of seeing the competition that you will all be eligible to compete in coming up next semester because usually this competition happens at the end of the first year. But due to the pandemic, we started and then had to stop and are back today to finish up. So we have two great competitors today that uh, have worked hard to make it to the final round. So we have Eliza Gupta and Akash Patel. So we congratulate both of them for making it to this round. They have worked very hard. We're proud of them, and you're going to see some of our very best orators at work today. We're also honored to have uh, Judge Stephen Diller from the Georgia Court of Appeals, who will be our presiding judge today, and Judge Paige Whitaker from Fulton County Superior Court joining us to bench the, our arguments today. So with that, uh, let me ask any of you who have phones to please silence them. Um, thank you for those of you who are joining us online. And with that, we will start our Walton competition. All rise. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. All persons having issues before the Honorable Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention. For the court is now sitting. All right. So maybe see them. Council, we're ready. Yes, Okay, all right. Unless we have any preliminary matters, you may proceed. May it please the court. My name is Elisa Gouda, and I represent Descend Upon Mercer, the petitioners in this case. I would like to reserve one minute of my time for rebuttal. Absolutely. Thank you. Your honors. This is a case about an attempt to silence the petitioner's right to peacefully protest injustice in public parks. Therefore, the petitioners respectfully request that this court reverse the lower court's holding and rule that the Mercer Capital Parks Bureau regulation, sections one, two, and three, as applied to descend upon Mercer, violate the petitioner's rights under the First Amendment for two reasons. First, the petitioner's conduct, specifically the petitioner's request to sleep in the park, as a part of a demonstration. How is that speech count? Yes, Your Honor. So sleeping in the park is a part of speech because it satisfies the elements of the test this court set out in Spence versus Washington, 1974. That test has two prongs. The first is the intent to convey a message. And the second is a likelihood that this message will be understood by onlookers. What message are they conveying? The message the petitioners are trying to convey is the fact that commercial enterprises and the wealthy have seized the political process. And how does sleeping convey that message? Sleeping conveys that message because of the methodology the protesters have uh, chosen to pick. So the protesters are using a very pervasive and inescapable protesting methodology, meaning that they have given up the comforts of their home, they have gone out and there in the cold in order to demonstrate the significance of the issue at play. What they, they have from, what are the park hours, 8 to 5? The park hours are from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m., but okay. that seems to insinuate if we only allow the petitioners to protest for 16 hours, that this problem is only a 16 problem hour a day problem, that this isn't something that's so pervasive, that doesn't occur every moment of every day. Why couldn't the same thing be accomplished, in, if not with a stronger message, by showing the willingness to come there, to be there 16 hours, to go home, and to come back the next day? That shows more dedication than simply setting up camp in the middle of the park. If, if, that, if that's the, the message, is the dedication, then I just don't understand how sleeping, if they don't sleep, that'd be one thing, right? Of course, they can't, they've got to sleep. 
So I don't see how sleeping necessarily conveys a message. Respectfully, Your Honor, I would disagree in the sense that sleeping is important not only for dedication, but also to demonstrate the significance of the problem in terms of that it's so important from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed that it is something that consumes your thoughts and that they have to be out in the elements. But is that what the First Amendment guarantees, counsel? Does the First Amendment guarantee that not only do you get to convey a message, but you alone get to dictate uh, the nature in which that message? I mean, it seems to me we're, we're quibbling here. The government's not restricting their speech. The government's not saying you can't say something. The government has reasonable regulations for its own part. I mean, doesn't the government have an interest in not having a bunch of hippies sleeping in the middle of their city? Uh, you're correct, Your Honor, in the fact that the government is entitled to regulate speech. They are entitled to use reasonable time, manner, and place restrictions, which brings me to my second point, though, that the government has failed to meet its burden. Let me ask you this. If sleeping, let's just assume for the sake of this argument that sleeping is protected, or it is speech, it's symbolic speech. If we have already held that the message of sleeping at a park can be restricted when the message is the plight of the homeless, who have nowhere else to sleep, then how is it that your group's message is more central and more important than that, such that it can't be restricted there, even though it could for the homeless? I think that our case here is distinguishable from Clark versus Community for Creative Nonviolence because the court chose not to specifically hold that the case you're referencing, that sleep was symbolic speech, it chose to assume without deciding and focus on the regulations in question. And so the difference here is that not only are the regulations in question not narrowly tailored, but we are informing the court to actually address this issue rather than just assuming. And there seems to be a sort of progression in the law as demonstrated in Occupy Fort Myers versus City of Fort Myers that is leaning towards the categorization of sleep as symbolic speech. Based on what? How, how is this progression happening in the law? And where, where, where is that progression based in the text and the history and the structure of the United States Constitution? It's, it's based in the structure of the United States Constitution because uh, from the Bill of Rights it, as the First Amendment, and courts have interpreted the importance of the right to free speech beginning in Snyder versus Phelps 2000, uh, before that, but in Snyder versus Phelps 2011, the court articulated the importance that this right is fundamental to American It is process. fundamental. The right to dissent is fundamental, but it seems to me that what's not narrowly tailored is your argument. Your argument seems to be with respect, that of a petulant child. If I don't get to do, say, what I want, if I don't get to do it in how, the exact manner that I want to do it, it seems like you're saying there's no time, place, or manner restrictions here at all, or the city has zero interest in being able to regulate what goes on. Having a, an Occupy group 24-7, I, I just don't see how the First Amendment protects that. The First Amendment protects that because it is the government, not citizens, who must justify the abridgment of First Amendment rights. And so the government is the person that has the burden in order to they demonstrate. They want to manage their part. And they, are they, they, they have like, given reasonable hours. You've got 16 hours to say everything you want. Well, how is that not government being, they're not shutting your voice down. Well, they're saying, we don't want you sleeping here. We don't want your, what about the fire hazard from the burners? I mean, we, we don't want a tent city in the middle of our uh, place of government or, or anywhere in our does city. Does the government have a right to protect this park? The government has a right to protect the park. But and does a sleeping ban provide more protection to that park than no ban? It does not. Because the government has failed to demonstrate that the sleeping of the petitioners has endangered the interests that they well, seek to protect. Well, isn't it an endangerment, though, when your client is bringing gas stoves, fires, and things that could be a fire hazard to this park? As uh, part of your staying overnight and sleeping in the park? Precisely, Your Honor, it hasn't been a danger because there have been two months that the government has chosen not to uh, initiate these regulations and not enforce them. And the fact that the government- And so they lose the right to? Is that your argument? So that's an estoppel argument. It's, it? it's not that the government necessarily loses the right, but it demonstrates that they're using speculation. And this court has articulated- Well, let me ask you this. Are we bound by whether your particular client has been a good steward of this park in deciding this issue? No, Your Honor, but it demonstrates that the interests the government has stated are not necessarily at play here. The government has articulated an interest to protect the park against violence, against wear and tear. But that's not how we judge interests. We judge interests by whether or not they're rational. At, at the time the law is passed, we don't judge them 
coming. It, it, I mean, I, I agree with with my colleague. It seems to me like you're suggesting that that we look at how you're doing it and then judge the reasonableness of the regulation. That's not necessarily the case, but that is how the government has chosen because the government chose not to enforce these regulations when the petitioners began their uh, protests. The petition that is because the that may be a political calculation that they that they decided how maybe this you know this would get out of your system in a little bit. I mean that just because I, I agree with my colleague, just because they didn't initially enforce it, unless you're making some sort of estoppel argument, I don't know why they're they, they can come in and enforce it. If that, if, if, if that's the question. So are they allowed to enforce it? They're allowed to enforce it, but the regulation needs to be narrowly tailored. And if the government is concerned about fires, if the government's concerned about violence, those are legitimate interests. But so then what, what would be, you're representing the government, how is it narrowly, how can they narrowly tailor it if you're demanding 24-7 access? That sounds like no regulation to me. Uh, not necessarily, Your Honor. The regulations could include a ban on littering. It could include a ban on starting fires. Those and it could include a ban on sleeping. Uh, but that ban would then undermine the message of the protesters that the problem is so pervasive and so important that they need to be there. Which brings me back to the question I asked you before about Clark. If we have already decided that a sleeping ban in a public park is a legitimate restriction, even assuming that that is symbolic speech, a legitimate restriction on the message of the plight of the homeless who have nowhere to sleep, then how is your message more important and more vital so that now all of a sudden the government is not able to enact a sleeping ban? Your Honor, it seems that I'm out of time. Do I have extra time? You can, I'd like you to can, answer you can Please answer her question. To answer your question, Your Honor, this is different because the court in that decision chose not to particularly decide that sleep was symbolic. And so now that we've had a progression and we've seen the importance of the First Amendment and the importance of protecting these rights that we should declare. Additionally, just because that speech is not necessarily protected, the other activities were held to be protected. And those regulations that address those activities are not narrowly tailored as well. So even if the court doesn't believe that sleep is symbolic speech, the government still failed to justify the other regulations as narrowly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Akash Patel, and I represent the respondent, the state of Mercer, in today's case. The respondent respectfully requests that this court affirm the holding of the lower court and find that the Capitol Park's Bureau of Regulations, subsections 1, 2, and 3, be upheld. Your Honors, this case is about the interests of the many and not the few. But, I mean, counsel, that's what the Bill of Rights is meant to protect. It's, it's, it's intentionally counter-majoritarian. So I don't really care about it. That's not, that's not what our job, our job is to look out for the minority. That's what our constitution does. Why isn't this core speech? Yes, Your Honor. Sleeping in tents at night in the park is not a form of free speech because it lacks any asserted symbolism. We can look to the case of Spence versus the state of Washington. In that case, the court gave us two elements. The first is that the, there must be an intention by the assertive, by the form of um, activity. And in, in addition, there also must be an ability for the intended onlookers to, uh, to be able to understand what the intention well, of the Well, so it certainly, is. certainly isn't there some evidence in the record that that message is being understood when it's grown to 250 individuals from 20 to 30. Isn't that evidence in the record that the message is being understood? Respectfully, no, Your Honor. We argue that sleeping in tents is not a form of free speech, but the fact that the numbers have grown could be could be contributed to the fact that uh, the message is being understood through other forms of permitted free speech during the 16 hours of the law. It's, during the it's day. not speech clearly when it's, if, if this were like a homeless tent city, but that's not what's going on here. They're, the core of their message is disruption. That's why the, the, the sleep is, is it, I don't see how you can argue that the, the nature, the unique nature 
of this, which is intended to be disruptive. And it's, it's a collective disruption. I don't know how you can argue that that's not core speech and fundamentally different from a bunch of homeless folks. They're, they're out of necessity. These are people that are setting aside their necessity to make a core political argument. So how is that? How does that not go to the very core of the First Amendment? Yes, Your Honor. In the case that you're referring to, Clark versus Community of Creative Nonviolence, the petitioners, protesters, use sleeping in public spaces to call, plight, call attention to the plight of homeless people. In that situation, sleeping in a public space was directly related to the issue of homelessness within the city. In the case at hand, it's unlike Clark. Right. It's That's sleeping. different than normal homelessness. So I, I'll grant you that. But didn't we predominate that question, as, as as your opposing counsel pointed out? So we didn't really we didn't really need to address it in that case, did we? No, Your Honor. And well, respectfully, no, Your Honor, because we had to find that this case is distinct, distinguishable. In the case at hand, there's no direct correlation between sleeping at a tent at night and the connection between the whatever uh, control the government. Isn't the in. connection here the twenty four hour? Full time, all day, all night takeover of the park, just like the assertion is that the wealthy are taking over the government. Respectfully, no, Your Honor. The sleeping at night uh, asserts no form of symbol symbolism and therefore cannot be found to be symbolic speech. That message could be, be uh, better understood through other forms of communication and free speech. Is it up to you to decide whether it's better right. understood? Is that the government's job? The government's job is to understand whether or not it, that message is readily understood by the onlooker. Well, let's there's assume no it is. There's no evidence in the record that suggests that sleeping in the park has uh, has been, been interpreted by any of the onlookers to uh, understand the fact that there is any control of the government by the protest, by the- uh, Well, I think as Justice Powers has already pointed out, this group has grown since it started sleeping in the park from 20 or 30 people to 250 people and only lessened after the government put these bans in place. Respectfully, yes, Your Honor. The uh, opposing counsel has pointed out the fact that also the, the um, number of protesters has grown. However, the petitioners failed to show that sleeping was a reason that the, that the number of protesters have grown. Let me ask you this. Let's just, just put that aside for now and assume that this is protected speech, symbolic speech. It seems like what we looked at in Clark was whether it was a reasonable time, place, and manner restriction. And it was significant that it wasn't prohibited at all times of the day and it wasn't prohibited in all of the parks. Here, we're talking about a 24 hour, no matter where you are, no matter where the park is open or closed, there will be no sleep. Doesn't that make it a more extreme and not narrowly tailored kind of regulation? Respectfully, no, Your Honor. If the court finds that sleeping is a form of free speech, the regulation should still be found to be constitutional because we can look to the test from the United States versus O'Brien, decided by this court in 1968. There, the court found that there must be a substantial government interest at stake. In the situation at hand, the state of Mercer hopes to protect the interests of protecting the park and protecting members of the public and members of the uh, protesters themselves from potential of unruly But that's protesters. one of the four prongs of that test. So great, you've met that one. My question was as to whether it was narrowly tailored. Yes, Your Honor. The, there's no evidence in the record that goes to show that these uh, regulations were implemented simply to hinder the ability of descent upon Mercer to convey their message. What harm has there been? Has there been any property damage to the park? No, Your Honor. Have there been any incidents of violence? No, Your Honor. However, the, the government need not wait until there is damage to the property to enact legislation. However, there only needs to be a potential for the interest to be at risk. The fact that the numbers are growing to 250 people shows that there is a substantial, uh, there's a substantial uh, potential for the, um, for the interest that the government has in this situation to be at risk. And therefore, why can't you just address it using other law? In other words, why can't you just address it on a case by case basis? Isn't that what the police do every day? Your Honor, legislation needs to be in place because it needs to be able to protect the interests of the government. And because this situation has grown to the way it has, it was it was valid for the state of Mercer to enact the, the narrow and narrowly tailored legislation. Uh, to protect the interests of the art, to protect the park, and protect the members of the public as a whole. So didn't you wait two months? Aren't you stopped 
at this point from, a, from enforcing that? You waited too much and almost gave them an implied permit, right? Respectfully, no, Your Honor. We, we're not stopped from establishing the law because, because the fact that the um, the fact that the interest were only broke the interest of the government and the damages to those interests were only growing as the numbers grew from October to December. At the time the legislation was enacted, the danger was at its peak, and therefore the, it was warranted for the government. So to it was not at its peak at 200. It wasn't at its peak at 150. What's the magic that it's now at its peak at 250? Well, there's no potential magic number uh, per se. However, only when there is a potential risk to those interests, we find it appropriate for the legislative authorities uh, to uh, establish legislation within the jurisdiction. It, it almost sounds, counsel, like your interest coincide with their message becoming stronger. So in other words, the stronger their message becomes, the more disruptive they become, which is the, it, once again, is the whole point of this to make, to send a message about the disruption that's happening in, in our culture and our society. Um, it, it, that seems to me to be what you, where you're saying your interest is. And I think that's troubling. Respectfully, no, Your Honor. I can draw the court's attention to the third prong of O'Brien. It states that the message, the, the government's message, the government's interest must be unrelated to the message that's trying to be, um, that's trying to be intended by the protesters. In the case at hand, the protesters are still permitted to pro to protest whatever message it may be, whether it be the control of the government or not. There is plenty of time, 16 hours throughout the day. If I can draw the court's attention to page 11 of the record. Judge Henderson says, in his opinion, that the 16 hours is ample alternative opportunity. Further, it's constitutionally sufficient time for the protesters to convey whatever message they want. And therefore, pro prohibiting the nighttime usage on the cart is not is unrelated to the fact that the messages are the fact that the regulations were put in place. It's merely incidental that there was any, if there was a, a, a little, if not any forms of um, Prohibitation on the ability of the message of the protest. But the problem the is there are some there is some conduct that inherently sends a message. You don't seem to think that's in play here. I think that sleeping 24-7, that sends a message to the community as to the power of the argument that they're trying to make here. And, and it's it's disruptive and it's it's obviously offensive to a lot of people and it's and it's going to make a lot of people in the community uncomfortable. So does flag burning. Flag burning also makes people uncomfortable, but it goes to the very core of political dissent. And here we're not talking about things that are kind of on the fringes of speech. We're talking about something that goes to the very core of First, of First Amendment speech. This is core political speech. So that's 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 what's troubling to me about your argument, Counsel. Your Honor, it seems that my time is up. May I use some time to answer your question? Absolutely. Respectfully, I would have to disagree with you, Your Honor. The, uh, if we look to Ward, we find that the, the freedom of speech is essential, but is not absolute. The government has the authority to regulate and protect its interests through reasonable regulations, which it has in this situation. And therefore, the respondent respects the request that this court affirm the lower court's holding and find that Capital Park's Bureau of Regulations, subsections 1, 2, and 3, are constitutional. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Counsel. Did, did we reserve time or did she, did Joe, did she have time to, for rebuttal? One minute. One minute. One minute. Okay, counsel. May it please the court. I would specifically like to address the issue of the importance of the protesters' cause and the question that you, Justice, pointed out about the difference between Clark versus community for creative nonviolence. And the difference here is key to the fact that this is a core political message. And while homelessness is an important issue, this gets at the heart of political speech and the importance of discourse on public issues. And the protesters here, by giving up their homes and by going out into the public, are demonstrating that they need to give up their necessities to combat this very necessary issue, that the political process has been seized by commercial enterprises. They have gotten rid of their commercial you know, extras, and they have gone out into the public and have gotten rid of all of these things, these extra things, in order to demonstrate that they are only living by necessity and that they need to articulate to the government that we need to get back to our fundamental understanding of American political process. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other matters, we'll take this under advisement. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Ce sera pour Nana. <rire> All rise. All right, you may be seated. All right, tell us how we proceed. You want us to give feedback? All right, I'm going to start with you. All right, it's going to be pretty brief. I've seen both of you all week this week. Um, I thought you both did the best of Kenya. Um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you certainly speak. You had a very hot lunch. I thought you um, handled questions really well, and congratulations to both of you. Well, I've got a second that. You both did a fantastic job, um, better than I've seen lawyers here in practice handle um, very difficult questions before and we were not easy on you we did not let up um, so you both were incredibly poised um, I think maybe is it Elisa or Eliza it's Elisa Elisa try to slow down just a little bit um, but you had so much to say you got it all in and it was important to make this point because that is the only critique at all I would have of you and uh, I, I thought you guys did a fantastic job. Uh, I echo everything that was said. I thought it's an interesting problem. Um, I thought you both did a nice job. Um, you know it's it's not easy with the mask that brings in a degree of difficulty. I mean, you can see I'm being a little slack here with mine, but um, but no, I thought y'all did well. I thought you it was a hot batch, and and but it, you know it's not unusual. It's certainly not unusual for my family to support. I ask a lot of questions. It's not unusual for me to ask a lot of questions, and you'll you'll notice I, I played both sides. And I do that at the Court of Appeals, too. So that's not unusual. I'm, I'm usually trying to go after what I think is the weakest part of your argument and see how you defend it. Um, I thought you both did a, did a nice job. I mean, I think, you know, there are things you can concede and things you can't concede. And the more you do this, the more you're going to kind of learn that. The, the one thing I would argue to both of you is there has to be some kind of play in the joints with your arguments. Um, you, you have to have, you, you, you have to think also about really good appellate lawyers think about what's the narrowest way that I can win this case. So if, if there's a way to do that, where you say, look, I, I get that, that you don't, maybe, Your Honor, you don't like this message, or you think maybe this is overbroad, but here's why we win. We win because even if you think that's the case, the way they tailored these regulations is clearly an attack on speech. It's clearly an attack on, you know, I mean, there's a way to, to maybe do it to try to, if you've got a hostile family, then you've got to think about it. Same for you on your position. You're defending the government. If you see someone that's going to be really hostile to government and is going to try to let, then you've got to think about a way to maybe bring that judge along on a narrower ground. That makes sense. So once again, I thought you both did a fantastic job. Congratulations. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> we uh, we've got the final tabulation, all that stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, so the uh, if you'll both stand up, the uh, and once again, congratulations to you both. Um, the winner is. Thank you.
once again, very well done. It's very close. And, um, very impressive. Anything, anything else for the good of the order? Yeah. All right. We will stand in recess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations.